Okay, this is Bruce Leroy, just Bruce. Um, let's look at the camera, Bruce. At this, let's go with that. You can go get that one. We'll, we'll re reorientate him so we have better camera presence. Um, Bruce and uh, his family are kind of special to me. Um, I started doing the dog behavior thing several years ago, and the very first client I had was a dog named Frank. And this is actually Bruce's roadmap success, but I'm gonna kind of uh, go through something in here. Yes, I'm gonna tell your story here in a sec. But anyways, uh, the Guardians found this little puppy during a blizzard. And the puppy was, I think, like eight, seven or eight weeks. If they wouldn't have found him, he would have been dead. Absolutely no question in my mind. They were not ready for a puppy. They were expecting their first child. They had, they had cats. They weren't pre uh, prepared for it at all. This was right when I started doing dog behavior work. They, they are my very, very first client. And I've been doing this now, I, about 2,000 plus dogs. And uh, I didn't know that this was my very first client until I came in the door and she reminded me. And uh, this is a different dog than Frank. Frank ended up getting rehomed because he had a very strong prey drive and they had cats. Um, but uh, he's in a great place now. And anyways, I just was kind of going, reminiscing going through memory lane uh, and how, how much I've changed and my techniques have changed since I first started doing this. All right, so now we'll get to your stuff, buddy. So uh, basically Bruce's main primary issue is he's territorial. He acts a little bit aggressively around people he does not know. And he's done a little bit of nipping. We have a lot of kids that come in and out of this house, and so it's obviously a great concern for the guardians. Now, from what I understand from talking with this, he really didn't have any rules or structure. And so dogs, generally speaking, if they think that they are a member of a leadership capacity of any sort, then they want to contribute to the group. I asked the guardians what he could do to help and they, or to make them happy, and they couldn't tell me. So I think in his mind, he said, look, they're super loving, they're super casual about who comes and goes. I can actually contribute to the group by being in charge of security. And this progressively happened. It started off one way, and then it got to the point where he nipped a guy in the backyard, which is his place he's a lot more territorial of. And he's on, and the guardian said he is on alert. I mean, he's in the backyard, he's going and patrolling. He's literally on patrol. So in order to help him, just like us, if we feel like we're responsible for somebody, we have pressure from that responsibility. If you're a parent and you have a child, you feel a little stressed out because you have to provide and nurture and take care of that child. He thinks that he's in charge of taking care of us, but the problem is, he probably tells the humans not to do certain things and the humans don't listen to him because we don't see him as an authority figure. And that can create more stress, just like a, uh, we baby proof a house to make sure that it's safe for a baby. The baby's not dumb, it just doesn't know any better to put its hand in the fire. And so basically I think that he has gotten his impression that he needs to protect the humans. So we need to change the leader follower dynamic so he doesn't feel the pressure or responsibility of taking care of them and doesn't have to be on duty. So the way we're going to do that is uh, by incorporating rules and structure. Dogs are big at uh, what they see us do, not what we do. A lot of times we have a tendency to think, I bought you, um, I buy your dog food, I buy you uh, uh, treats and all the rest of this stuff. Dogs are like, I didn't see you build the house, I didn't see you hunt that food. So they don't give us credit for those things. The video I did a little bit ago, we showed the guardian claiming the area around the door. That's a big one. Security for the pack is typically handled by one of the authority figure dogs. And so if the dog can see the humans are handling that for them, then that means I don't have to be in charge. I don't have to be on guard because they've got it under control. He's only doing this because in his mind, he thinks he's a little bit of a chauvinist as a lot of male dogs are. The little woman can't take care of this by herself because when the husband's around, he doesn't act this way. Um, and so I think he thinks that he needs to protect her because she loves, she's such a loving person, which is a great human tactic or a trait, but dogs see unconditional love as a weakness. So that probably accelerated. On top of that, the guardians have petted him for the wrong things. So when they come home from work, he's excited they pet him. Well, that's, in, anything your dog is doing when you pet it is what you're reinforcing. And that's reinforcing and rewarding unbalanced behavior. Even though excited is a more positive, unbalanced behavior, it's still unbalanced. And a dog can be happy and calm or excited and not happy. They are not mutually exclusive. So when the guardians come home, I would like them to ignore Frank, if, or <laughs> Frank, Frank was the other dog, uh, to ignore uh, Bruce until he is relaxed. So if we reach over and when he's relaxed, we reach to pet him and he starts wiggling and gets up, then we pull back and we just continue on our business. We don't tell him no, we don't chastise him. It's just the thing that you want the most isn't gonna happen if you're overexcited. And after a while, he'll learn to be calmer. Now, petting with a purpose is something I like to do and that I recommend the guardians do because I saw him invade their personal space and they reached over and petted him. So anything your dog is doing when you pet it is what you're reinforcing. Well, he comes over and scratches and nudges sometimes when he wants attention. He's telling the humans what to do. 
And that can even uh, exasperate his, his perception of being the authority figure. So in order to change the leader-follower dynamic, we're going to do, uh, in, start enforcing rules. This helps the humans practice demonstrating in front of him that we have the leadership role handled. So some of the rules we went over are no furniture, uh, and uh, for a certain period of time, and then furniture with an invitation, and only for good behavior. Uh, that way the human is controlling the resource, not the dog. Uh, when the humans are eating dinner, he shouldn't be allowed on the tile around. We have carpet to tile in the kitchen and the dining room, so it's a very easy line for him to, get, uh, to stay across. We can use the third escalating consequence to march directly at him and move him off of that. The same thing we did for the door exercise. Um, I'd like to, uh, when uh, humans are cooking food in the kitchen, we can put a, a line of tape down and say that he's a lot in the linoleum, but not in the linoleum around the kitchen when we're preparing food. The rest of the time he can go in there, no problem. Um, he has to have to sit before he goes in or out of a door. To a dog, sitting is a more subordinate position. So if he has to go and sit at the door, he's putting himself in a subordinate position and also asking by sitting down. It gives the humans a nice visual indicator that the dog wants to go outside. Um, let me see, what are some other rules? Having him sit and wait before we go up or down the stairs, and then we call him up after we're all up there first. For dogs, whoever's in front is literally considered in the leadership position. Whoever's behind is considered a follower. So teach, having, uh, having Bruce uh, in the follower position in a whole lot of different small scenarios will lead up to bigger changes. Um, let me see, other rules that we incorporated were, um, uh, let me see, having to sit and wait for permission to eat his food. Right now the guardians are feeding him about an hour or two before they're eating breakfast. Dogs eat in the order of their rank. So by simply, now they do make him sit and wait and they give him permission. Now they're, and they say, okay, go, which we don't want to use. We want to come up with a unique command word, okay is a top 50 word in terms of usage in the US. So maybe we say grub or chow or feast. The way we assign that is every time the dog goes over and takes its first bite for like one or two months, we say feast. And after we say one or two months of doing that, we say feast and he goes over and he knows that means I have permission to eat my food. Because when I hear the word feast, food is in my mouth. Uh, when we're giving, and before we go on uh, a little bit more of that, anytime you're giving a treat, make sure that the treat touches your dog's lips and then we say down. So we're activating his pleasure receptors and then we have the positive association with the, the great tasting treat is associated with the command word. Uh, let me see, so um, uh, if the humans are going out a door, he should also go out after the humans. If the, we're on a walk and all the humans are with, all the humans should go through the door first, then the handler with the leash goes in, then he comes in last. All right, um, I'd like the guardians, uh, right now they're petting him without a purpose and uh, petting him when he is ex in an excited state of mind like when they first come home from work. Well, excited is not necessarily happy when it comes to dogs, and most people confuse the two. Excited is an unbalanced state of mind. It is a more positive unbalanced state of mind, but it's still unbalanced. And so if we come home and he's bouncing around, we pet him, we're reinforcing that. Anything our dogs do when we pet it is what we're reinforcing or rewarding them. What starts off with a little bit of excitement after being petted every time the guardian comes home for a year and a half, two years, three years, now the dog is really excited. So a lot of the problems I get called in to solve are caused by the humans. So adding a little bit of structure to this, so uh, to petting him with petting with a purpose can go a long ways, which I'll cover in a sec. When we come home, if he's excited, just ignore him. Don't say no, don't chastise him, don't push him away, just act like he's not there. As soon as he settles down, reach towards to pet him. And if he start, gets up and gets wiggling, pull your arm back and continue about your business. Wait for him to settle down and try again. I've had several dogs where the first time I only get this far, second time I get this far, third time this far, fourth time here, fifth time I'm actually petting. So it might take several interruptions before you realize, oh, me getting excited is what stops you from petting me, but I like you petting me, so I'm gonna stay calm. Calm and balanced, just like us, is when we're gonna be at our best. Uh, petting with a purpose, instead of petting the dog when he nudges us, when he tells us what to do and we pet him, that tells him that he has dominion over us and that can accelerate and enhance his perception that he needs to protect us. So from now on, when he scratches us, we're going to tell him to sit. And when he sits, we're going to pet him under his chin and say the word sit. Not good dog, not good boy, just the word sit. And don't say sit. Say it consistently, dogs hear uh, pronunciation. So we say just the command word. After a while, instead of coming up and scratching at us, he's gonna come start sitting down at us and saying, look, I'm prepaying for some attention. Can you give me a little bit of scratch in my belly? Yes, we can because you prepaid for it. Now, if we come in the room and we see that somebody's petting the dog and he's standing up, we would say the word paycheck. And that person would stop petting him immediately, tell him to sit, and as soon as he sits, we pet him and say the word sit and tell their partner. Actually, I asked him to sit before he came in, he stood up and I continued to pet him and David said that's okay, which it is. 
Uh, let's say I just want to pet him. I'm still going to ask him to sit. I want him to think that if I want petting or attention from a human, I have to take a more subordinate position, which sitting is. I have to pay for it, so I have to pay for it by sitting. And it's a nice, po more polite way for the dog to interact with us. Now that leads me to something I like to call passive training. You can train your dog to do anything it does on its own by simply rewarding it within three seconds and then uh, of it doing the action. So every time that Bruce comes to us, we want to pet him and say, come. Every time he sits down, now we just pet him and say, sit. Pet him, every time that he uh, lays down, we pet him and say, chill. After we do that enough, when we say chill, it's associated with this position with the reward and he's inclined to do that. These are great ways to train your dog without even really thinking about it. Petting with a purpose and passive training are the easiest things you can do that will have the biggest impact on your dog because every time you do it, it's like a micro dog obedience training session you do without even thinking about it. Now, um, that leads me to a positive reinforcement. I like to use positive reinforcement for dogs and I found out a way to use positive reinforcement for kids. The first child in this family is named Frank after the dog that was my very first client. <laughs> now, um, what we can do is go to like an arts fair and get a couple jars or glasses and have the kids paint their names on it, put some decoration. When we come home, we explain to the kids, I don't tell them petting is our way of paying the dog, I say petting our dog is our way of saying thank you. So from now on, every time you thank the dog for doing the right thing, I'm gonna take an M&M and put it in your jar. So dogs go through repetition, consistency, and good timing. If we have the kids now competing with each other to get more M&Ms by asking the dog to do desired behaviors, the dog is practicing those desired behaviors and they're gonna engage in those desired behaviors more frequently. So if you have th two kids that are each doing it 30, uh, you know, doing 30 things a day with each dog or, uh, or with each child, that's 60 a day at the end of the week. That's, you know, 400 plus repetitions. At the end of the month, we're over 2,000 repetitions for desired actions and behaviors. My clients who do this are amazed at how fast the dog modifies and imp uh, improves its behavior and doing the things that we want and forgetting about things that we don't want because that doesn't get the reward. Um, okay, I also want the guardians to use the escalating consequences. I use the third one when we uh, move the dog away from the door. Um, I'm not going to go through those here, but if you go to doggoneproblems.com, click on dog training tips on the left side of the page. I think this is how it's left when I, we're looking at this. Um, but there will be a search box. Type in escalating consequences. There will be a bunch of, of write-ups I've done for other clients where there will be a video where I go through those in detail. Some of the, uh, so that's the third consequence we'll use to keep the dog out of the kitchen keep the dog out of the living room. Um, and the dog should not be within seven feet of anyone's eating. If he's not actively begging when one of the kids is eating a banana, being within seven feet is inappropriate. Now, to teach him to stay out of the kitchen when we're cooking, I would put a, paint, uh, a line of painter's tape between the cabinet and the wall over here so that basically that's the line that we're gonna enforce. And again, as I talked about in uh, this video about claiming the door, uh, we want to rush at the dog until it gets across that line and then keep our hips pointed at that dog so it, he knows that we are paying attention to it. Now, burning energy is a big thing for dogs. One of the things I talked about uh, off camera was if we tell the dog to sit and he just, if he lays down, we just think it's no big deal. But it's indicative of not listening to the humans is not important because, or listening to humans is not important because when you don't, nothing happens. So if, he's, if we tell him to sit and he doesn't sit, get up and follow him. Don't do it aggressively. Don't say sit multiple times. But follow him until, if he goes in a room, close the door behind you. Eventually, he'll find himself cornered, then bark out the order again, sit! When he sits, we just walk away. But he has to understand that from now on, when the humans ask me to do something, it is not optional. They are going to stop what they're doing and burn the energy to follow through and get their way. Do this for a month. If you do it militantly, consistently for a month, he'll start doing it faster and faster. And that's, again... The difference between a dog thinking it's optional to do what he wants or I have to do what they want because the human's going to get their way no matter what. I'll just do it right away. Um, let me see. So, uh, let me pass the training. Uh, Estimating consequences. Um, trying to think. Uh, oh, the, oh, we went through a couple exercises. One of them we did was a focus exercise, which is a great way to redirect your dog's attention. We don't have footage of this, but that's, in the, again, something you search for in Dog on Problems. But basically, I'd like the guardian to practice this at least once a day every day and get up to the 20 second focus within seven to 10 days. Now at first we're doing it's one second, one second, but eventually it's one second, two seconds. Then eventually one second, three seconds. Eventually one second, 20 seconds. But when you're doing this, you wanna do it with about 10 or 12 treats a time. And then we wait for the dog to look at us, immediately go focus. Don't say the focus till it goes in their mouth. And then all 12 treats, we just do one second, one second. Maybe once you start staring at us well, then we go one second, two seconds for all 12 treats the next time. 
the dog's gonna go at his own pace. So don't make it each time we add a second. It's based on how well he performs. Um, and I'd like the mom and dad to both practice this exercise for the next couple of days. And then I'd like to have Frank starting to participate as maybe on the second or third day. Um, Cause that way I want the dog to see the humans as authority figures, not things that he needs to protect or be possessive or protective of. Um, now for the backyard, the backyard's gonna be more difficult because that's, he's really on guard in the backyard. If you do see him kind of on patrol, that would be a great time to practice the focus. Oh, one other thing about the focus, at first when we, want, when we want to do it, we want to practice in a room like this where it's nice and quiet. But eventually we want to practice it when the kids are maybe upstairs monkeying around, we can hear them, but we can't see them. Then eventually with the kids wrestling in the room. So we want to gradually make the, uh, apply the focus in more and more difficult situations. At first, stay in the house. Once you get up to 20 seconds of the house, then I'd like you to, uh, sorry buddy, my knees are going. Uh, then we want to practice this in the backyard. And in the backyard, is gonna be harder for him because he's used to being on guard. So, you know, if you have to, put him on a leash and step on the leash and prevent him from running around and just practice it. You might have to go back to one second in the backyard for all 12 treats and then do it in different places in the yard. Dogs don't do very, do very good at generalizing. They have to do things in 20 to 40, or excuse me, 40 to 80 locations and variations before they can start generalizing. So the more you practice in this corner, that corner, by the grill, by the tree, by the deck, after a while, you say focus, he just stops what he's doing and looks up at you. It's a great way to redirect your dog's attention. But uh, a lot of it is gonna be, like I said, demonstrating things like claiming the door. That's another activity I like the guardians practicing at least once a day. Now, the more you practice it, the faster at it he'll get. So maybe when, uh, what we wanna do is instead of being caught by surprise, maybe when we have the uh, guardian, when he comes home from work, he, he parks in the driveway and he texts the, the other guardian so she knows what's going on don't wait at the door, wait here, sit on the couch, act like you're casual, but then you get up and go and answer the door. When we have people dropping kids off to play with their kids, maybe we have them text us when they pull up in the driveway. So and then have them come to the door and knock so we can practice this. Eventually, he'll just sit at that line and wait and he sees the humans have it under control. He doesn't need to be in charge of, or responsible for them. We remove that responsibility, we remove a lot of pressure and a lot of stress and let him go back to being a dog because he's a pretty calm, relaxed dog Yes, you are pretty chill. And so he needs to be able just to relax. Um, let me see, I covered, uh, I think, just about everything. Oh, feeding. Did I cover feeding in this one? We redid this video. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, just make sure we're adding uh, the humans are eating first, um, and then the dog has permission to eat after. And look for ways to delay gratification. Ask him to sit and wait before we throw the ball. Um, you know, sitting at the stairs, I don't know if we went through that in this one, but that would be another rule that he has to sit and wait at the bottom of the stairs for the humans to go up first. Humans go out a door to the garage into a bedroom. He should always be the last one to come in. All right, um, is there anything else, buddy? How about a treat? Up. Oh, we've been working on his up command. Let's see how he does. That is pretty impressive. I might get a tip. Can we shake on it? All right. This is not Frank, this is Bruce, but this is my very first client and uh, you gotta make me look good, buddy. My reputation's <laughs> on the line. Come here, buddy. One last little thing, sit down. Remember, everything you do trains your dog, only sometimes you mean it. Shake, That's, we don't want we don't shake with that one. There we go, shake. High five, we'll see you in the funny papers. <laughs>